Hello, welcome back. Now we're looking at, uh, well, our third uh, calculation of a type 2 error problem, but this one is going to be a little bit different. Here we're looking at calculating a type 2 error when we're looking at a two-tailed test. Much of this process is going to be the same. Hopefully you'll see the similarities, but there are going to be just a couple of differences that we have to um, consider because we're looking at a two-tailed test. So again, we're working off of a previous problem, 9-1-D. I'm not going to go through all of these uh, initial steps. That's what we did in problem 9-1-D. But just to give us a little bit of context here, of course, this is a, this is a problem where we're filling, I don't know, we're manufacturing water bottles. And we're printing labels on those water bottles to mark different volumes. And we wanted to do a test to see if the, the position of the labels were accurate. And, and so we had developed this two-tailed test. We're looking at the, the marking on the bottle that corresponds with 24 ounces. And so we, we did the test to see, is it accurate? Is it 24 ounces? Is it not 24 ounces? We did this at the 10% level of significance. And we found our p-value here was uh, 0 0.118. So our conclusion was to not reject. So there's a summary of um, problem 91D. Now, to get into this calculation of a type 2 error, remember there's a couple of steps um, that happen first. So when we were looking at the one-tail tests, remember we, we talked about this situation where we have this distribution that exists when we assume HO is true. So here we have a distribution with a um, hypothesized value of 24. And then from the population is where we draw that sample. So let's say, you know, here's, here's our sample mean here. And then we standardized that, right? And then that would give us a Z score. And then we would compare that Z statistic against some critical value. Now, what I'm looking at here is a, a previous example of a one tail ex, uh, exercise, right? When we were looking at then how do we calculate the, the probability of a type two error? Well, then we would need to start with what is that critical value that corresponds with alpha and work backwards to identify what is that X bar star, right? What does that value for the sample mean that corresponds with that critical value? And then we would say, okay, now what if the actual population mean was, I don't know, let's say 25. We would then drop this value down and then we would calculate that probability of a type 2 error. Okay, so everything I'm talking about here, this is review. This is based on the problems looking at calculating the type 2 error for a one-tail test. Here we're looking at a two-tail test. So what's going to be different? Well, there's going to be a couple of things. First of all, remember, we, we, re we reject if the test statistic is either too big or too small. So we have two critical values here. I have Z, oops, I have Z alpha by 2 in that upper tail, and I have Z alpha by 2 in the lower tail, which means then I'm going to have two X bar stars. And so that means that I'm going to have these two values that if when I draw a sample, if that sample mean is larger than that upper tail X bar star, then I know that that sample mean is going to result in a test statistic that is greater than that upper tail critical value, which of course is a reject. If I have a sample with a mean that is less than that lower X bar star, 
when I calculate the corresponding test statistic, that's going to result in a test statistic less than that lower tail critical value, which also means we're going to reject. So in between those X bar stars is my do not reject space. So then when we're looking at calculating that type 2 error, well now I have this one X bar star here, but I have another X bar star here. And so that means that now we're going to have to calculate this region between those two X bar stars to give us our value for beta, the probability of calculating uh, a, a type 2 error. So where do we begin with this? Well, it's really the same calculation that we did when we were looking at calculating a type 2 error for a one-tail test. So I'm not going to go through the derivation. I've gone through the derivation before where we looked at calculating that X bar star was equal to the hypothesized value, 20, in this case, 24. Uh, and if we were doing an upper tail test or a lower tail test, well, that determined whether or not I had a plus or minus here. Now we're doing a two tail test. So it's going to be that 24 plus or minus I'm going to have this 1.645 again. This is my Z alpha divided by 2. And remember here, alpha is 0.1. So that critical value is 1.645 times our standard deviation, which was 1.4 over the square root of our sample size. Okay, so again, I'm pulling these numbers from up here. There's that standard deviation, 1.4. There's that sample size. Uh, it was 30. Okay, so it's entirely the same calculation, only this part here is different. And of course, this part here is different because it's a two tail test. When it was a one tail test, we only use Z alpha, and I use either plus or minus, depending on which tail of the distribution we are looking at. So if I punch these numbers in, I'll do the plus 1.645 first, 1.4 over root 30. So I have as the upper 2442, and as the lower 24 minus 1.645, over root 30. As my lower, I have 23.58. Okay, so why don't I write these up here just so we can visualize it. Oops, a little better. Okay, here we go. So that upper was 24.42. And the lower is 23, let me just make sure I have it right, 23.58. That should be an 8 here. Okay, so we've got our two values for x bar star. Those correspond with our critical values here of negative 1.645 and positive 1.645. Now, coming down to the second distribution, because remember when we're doing these calculations of our exposure to a type 2 error, we are looking at this other distribution that satisfies the alternative hypotheses. So in this example, the alternative hypothesis is that it is not 24. And so here we're given this value. The actual population mean is 23.2. So here I need to redraw this distribution. It's in the wrong spot. 
that distribution is 23.2. Oh, so it's actually way down here somewhere. I'm not going to be able to draw this to scale perfectly well, but that's fine. I don't actually really need that part of the distribution. So there's my two values. Let me redraw this a little better. What a mess. So here's our 23.2. Okay, now one thing that we can see here is that one of our values, this one here, 24.42, is way off in the tail of that hypothesized um, alternative distribution. So it might not even come into effect. It might not even matter. That probability associated with 24.42 might be so small that it's trivial. But what we need here is to calculate, okay, if, if the actual mean is 23.2, what is the probability of drawing a sample from that distribution, right? So this is H A is true with a mean of 23.2. What is the probability of drawing a sample mean, a sample with a mean from that distribution that falls into here our do not reject space? So that's between these two values here. So the probability that I want is that area there. So really it's between these two values. 23.58 and 24.42. Now, the way that I can do this uh, is, is relatively straightforward. I can take the probability to the left of 24.42. So again, let me just draw a picture for you. If I take this area 24.42, if I calculate this area, or I look up this area in the table, to the left of 24.42, and then I look up the other one, which was 23.58, and I find the area to the left of 23.58, and I subtract it, right? So if I subtract the red area from the purple area, I'll be left with exactly what I need, okay? So before I can get those probabilities, I need to standardize these two values. So let's look at the first one. I'll take 2442, and I wanna find the corresponding Z value for that. So that's gonna be 2442 minus 23.2 over 1.4 root 30. So let's see what they get here. That can't be right, I made a mistake. 24.42 minus 23.2 divided by 1.4 over root 30. There we go, that gives me a value 4.77. And then I want to standardize 23.58. So that's going to be 23.58 minus 23.2. And that gives me one point. 49. Now, I can already see that this one is going to be pretty much insignificant in our calculations. If I look up 4.77, I'm going to scroll down to my Z tables here. And if I look up 4.77, well, my goodness, it's not even, it's down here somewhere. Right? So, that number is approaching one. So the area to the left 
of a Z score of 4.77 for the purpose of my calculation, considering I don't need to be accurate to five, six, seven decimal places, I'm just going to consider that that value is one. Good. So with that in mind, and knowing that all I want is this area here, well, I can actually now just look at that upper tail probability for 2358. So I look at this test statistic 1.49. Well, we can look at the lower tail if we want, but then we have to subtract it from one. So if I have 1.49, let's see, I'm right here, 1.49, So that gives me a value of 0.93 in the lower tail. But if I want the upper tail, it has to be 1 minus 9319. So that gives me a value in the upper tail of 0.06. If I looked up, well, 68. If I look up the negative for 1.49, which is sometimes uh, a little bit easier. Negative 1.49, there we go. Well, there, that gives me 0 0.0681. Good, so that's it. That's all there was to it. If, if that 24.4 was, was more relevant for us, looking at that probability there, and I would have gone to my Z tables and found that probability just as we did, my beta would have been equal to the probability that corresponds with that 24.42, which for us was basically one, minus the probability that corresponds to um, 1.49, which we found was, uh, was at 1.93, Let's just make sure I'm accurate here. 1.9319, which of course gave us 0 0.0681. Good. So that gives us our exposure to a type two error for this two-tailed test. If the actual mean is 23.2. Okay, good. So we've got G done. Our beta we found is 0 0.0681. Interpret this value. This tells us that if the actual population mean is 23.2, we risk roughly a 7% chance here of committing a type 2 error of falsely accepting the null hypotheses. If the manager states that she is willing to risk a 10% probability of a type two error, if the average volume is within 0.5 ounces of specification, how large should the sample size be? So once more, we've gone through this before. I'm not gonna go through the derivation of this, uh, uh, of this formula, but You've seen in previous exercises, in the one-tailed, we had a formula that looked like this. This is squared, and then this was mu a mu o squared, or mu o mu a, actually. It probably doesn't make a difference, but let's be consistent. And that was our formula for sample size for a given level of significance and a given level of exposure to a type two error. The only difference for us here when we're working with a two-tailed test is that this is alpha divided by two. So going through these calculations, this is just 1.645, again, because alpha is 0.1, so alpha divided by two is 0.05, plus, well, now we need Z beta and Z beta, if this is for 10%, well, I have to come down to my tables and I'm looking for 
and there's 0 0.1 is going to be 1.28 for my z beta 1.28 squared sigma was 1.4 our hypothesized value was 24 and that acceptable difference for the alternative the magnitude of error that we're comfortable with is here we see 0.5 ounces of specification so I'm within 0.5 so what I would add here is really either 24.5 higher or 23.5 lower it doesn't make a difference in the calculations because the difference is always going to be 0.5 it might be positive it might be negative but it gets squared anyways so it doesn't matter here which way we go so now if I punch through our numbers 1.645 128 squared times 1.4 squared divided by 0.5 squared here I have a sample size of 67. You get a decimal, I get 67.076. But we can't have a fractional sample size, so I round it to the nearest whole number. Good, so if we want to set up an experiment that meets these criteria, that we're doing it at the 10% level of significance, we're willing to accept a 10% chance of committing a type 2 error if we're within half an ounce of specification. So what that's saying, we're looking at that water bottle and we've got this label on there that says 24 ounces. I'm comfortable with a 10% chance of believing that the label is accurate if it's within half an ounce. So that half an ounce is really stating the, the magnitude of the error that I'm comfortable accepting. Good. Okay, so that's it for our discussions on type 2 error. Next videos, we're going to be getting into a slightly a different type of test. Familiar, but different. Okay, thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.